Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about plant structure. So a good way to think about this is plant anatomy. If you've never stood next to a giant sequoia, then you should. Uh, it dwarfs all the trees around it, and it shows you how huge plants can become. Just using a few simple ingredients like water, carbon dioxide, and a few nutrients from the soil, you can become massive. And you can see the rings that we'll talk about kind of near the end. And so basically, everything I'm going to talk about, for the most part, is going to be angiosperm, so flowering plants. And flowering plants can be broken down into two different types, dicots and monocots. And so what is a cot? A cot is simply a cotyledon. And so a cotyledon is going to be a baby plant leaf. And so here we've got two different seed types. There's going to be a seed coat around the outside, a little endosperm in here, but you can see this baby plant. And in this dicot, you'll have two cotyledons, one, two. But in a monocot, you're only going to have one. Now, the quintessential dicot that I think of is dandelion, and monocot I think about is grass. And so if you've ever looked at a dandelion leaf, all the veins, which really are vascular material, it's kind of like our circulatory system, moving water and sugar, are going to be net-like. They're going to branch out. But if we're talking about a monocot, they're going to be parallel. So if you've ever looked at the veins in a grass, uh, a blade of grass, it's going to be all parallel. If you were to look at their flowers in a dicot, they're going to have four to five, or multiples of four to five on their petals. So you can see one, two, three, four, five. It's probably a dicot. Whereas if it's a monocot, they're going to be in multiples of three. So you can see that this one has six petals, and so it's going to be a monocot. And then another way to differentiate between the two is going to be roots. A dandelion, if you've ever tried to pull one out, they have this really big taproot system. But in monocots, like grass, they're going to have a net-like root system. It's going to be what makes up sod, for example, in grass. And so those are the different types of angiosperms. When we talk about phytotomy, you should realize that plants live a double life. They have a life underground. And we call that the root system. And then they have a life above ground. We call that the shoot system. Um, within that shoot system, basically, you're going to have nodes. So that would be a node there, a node there. We'd have another node there and another node up here. But the distance between those nodes is going to be the internode. So that would be the internode between the two. And so basically plants are able to grow up, but they're also able to grow out at each of these node points. Just like us, they're going to have tissues. And so in us, if we're talking about tissues, now you would think of muscular, skeletal, excuse me, muscular, nervous, uh, connective, and then epithelial. But in plants, there are just going to be three types of tissues. They have dermal tissue ground tissue, and then vascular tissue. And just like us, they break that into specific types of cells. Uh, we've got the epidermis, which is the dermal lining. And then we have periderm, which is going to be mostly when we get to the level of bark, so it's secondary growth. Function of that is to provide protection. So the, this is a cross-section of a leaf, so it's going to provide protection from the outside. Same thing right here. You can see this in a stem. We're going to have dermal tissues on the outside. And they also prevent water loss. Um, so basically epidermis is the big type of dermal tissue. Uh, ground tissue is going to be just run-of-the-mill cells. And so this is going to be broken into three types. And these words are really fun to say, parenchyma, calenchyma, and sclerenchyma. What do they do? Basically, they do the jobs of the plant. So they're going to be the site of photosynthesis, for example, in the leaf. But it's going to be metabolism, metabolism, storage, growth. All of that's going to be in the ground tissue. And then finally, we have the vascular tissue. That's made up of two types, xylem and phloem. And they're going to move the water and the sugar. So we'll get more specific to each of these. So let's start with the dermal tissue tissue. Uh, dermal tissue, for the most part, is going to be epidermis. So right here we're looking at a cross-section of a leaf. So this would be dermal tissue on the top and on the bottom. The guard cells also make up part of that. And the guard cells, you can see a zoomed-in version of it right here. Basically what they do is they surround the stomata, or this opening. What does the stomata do? You can see it's the hole in the leaf. Basically, it allows water to evaporate out, and that water, as it evaporates out, is going to carry water all the way up in the plant. But they also bring in a really important gas. That's going to be CO2. And so plants kind of have guard cells that are doing really good feedback. Basically, if they have a lot of moisture and they can let a lot of it go and it's really sunny, they open the guard cells up and the stomata are going to allow a lot of water to come out, a bunch of carbon dioxide in, and so they can make a bunch of sugars. 
Likewise, if it's really, really hot, really, really dry, they can close up the stomata so they don't lose all of their water. One thing that I should mention is going to be this real waxy covering on the epidermis. That's called the cuticle. And it's like wax. It's that wax that you feel on the, that slippery stuff you feel on the outside of a leaf. And that's going to prevent water from getting in and getting out. If we get to the ground tissue, basic run-of-the-mill cells are going to be parenchyma cells. The typical plant cells, parenchyma cells, what do they do? They're going to be the site of metabolism, site of photosynthesis. Outside that, as a, as a plant starts to grow, we have the calenchyma. I always remember the C and the L, and calenchyma stands for celery. And so those are going to be these real durable cells on the outside of celery. They provide support as it starts to grow. And so you can see the dermis on the outside, calenchyma cells, and then these are going to be parenchyma cells right here. They provide support. And if you take a, a plant as it grows and just mess with it all the time, push it all the time, simulating like wind, the calenchyma gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But it never gets as strong as the sclerenchyma. Sclerenchyma are going to be the really durable, wooded kind of portions of the plant as it starts to grow. This is a sclerenchyma fiber that's cut in half. If we were to look at a fiber, we could find this. This is hemp. That's, uh, we pulled the sclerenchyma cells out to use these fibers to make rope. It's incredibly durable. And so sclerenchyma is going to be these big fibers that give it that uh, really, really strong, like in a branch, that growth. But we'll also have sclerenchyma cells like the core of an apple, for example, is sclerenchyma. It's protecting the seeds on the inside. Or the grit on the inside of a pear is sclerenchyma. So that's the ground. Now we go to the vascular. Vascular is going to be made up of two types, the xylem and the phloem. So in this, we're cutting a stem apart. This would all be xylem in here. And then level four right here is going to be uh, phloem. Basically, xylem is moving water. It's going to move water from the roots to the shoots. Phloem is going to move sugar up and down in a plant. Um, and so on the outside, we'd have dermis, and then we're going to have some sclerenchyma cells that are giving it durable uh, support. So now we're going to talk about growth and then finally finish up with flowers. But this is an old story. If you go and take a spike and hammer it into a, a tree, let's say we put it at about three feet right here, and you come back in 100 years, so let's say, <laughs> make it more realistic, 40 years, and the plant, the tree now, instead of being, whatever, 16 feet tall, is 160 feet tall, how high is that spike going to be? Uh, well, the right answer is it'll still be three feet tall because plants grow from the top and they grow from the bottom. They grow from the shoots and the roots, but the middle is going to stay the same. Now, the bark is going to start to grow up, and so that tree might have, the spike might not be as far in, but just like humans, we first grow up, get much, much longer, and then we're going to, I could tell you this, as you get older, you start to get wider and wider and wider. And so we call this primary growth, this first growth. And how does that occur? Well, we use something called an apical meristem. Basically, that's going to be a site. Right here, we're looking at a root where you have cells that keep copying themselves. We call those undifferentiated. Think of it like a stem cell that keeps making copies of itself. And so that's going to make new cells. And as those cells get longer, as they mature and get larger and larger and larger, that's going to push this stem or root in this direction. Now, I can tell this right here is going to be a ram or a root apical meristem because it has this root cap on the top of it. And that root cap is going to allow it to push through the soil to find water. Um, and so this meristem is actually going to produce new cells on this side, which will make the root cap, and then cells on this side that make this uh, root itself. If you look up at the SAM or the shoot apical meristem, it's not going to have this root cap because it doesn't have to, it's just pushing its way through air. So it's not going to have this, but it's still going to have this meristem because it's producing new cells behind it. And as they mature, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's going to allow us to grow up and down, but we also have secondary growth. Secondary growth allows us to get wider. So th secondary growth, think about wooded growth. And so we're looking at a tree now in this diagram that's been sliced in half, and we're zooming in kind of to the bark portion. And so basically what you have is xylem. So xylem is going to be here on the inside. So let's put an X for the xylem, and then you're going to have phloem here. And so what's creating the xylem and the phloem? This layer called vascular cambium. So what it's doing is it's producing new xylem here, and it's producing phloem on this side. The phloem, remember, moves the sugar, and the xylem is going to move the water. So we got xylem, vascular cambium, phloem. As we move up, you have a layer called the phelloderm, which isn't found in all plants, so let me cross that out. And then we have the cork cambium. So the cork cambium is another meristematic layer, and that, just like the vascular cambium made phloem and xylem, cork cambium is going to make this waterproof cork on the outside. 
And so this guy right here is peeling bark back from a tree. And so what is he exposing right here? He's really exposing the vascular cambium. He's got xylem on the inside, phloem on the outside. And so what he would really do, if this is a tree that's just standing, he would be girdling the tree. He'd be killing the tree. Because if you remove that phloem and everything out, then sugar can't move up and down in a plant. You'd still have the xylem here, but without sugar, you can't have uh, life. And so one thing you know around here when you cut down a tree is what you'll get are these rings. And so you see these rings. What are those rings? Well, the inside of a tree wood, for that matter, is going to be xylem. And so basically what happens is it's going to be wider when the cells are laid down during summer because it's growing really, really quickly. But in the fall, it's going to be more dense. And in the spring, because we can't grow as quickly, not at all in the winter. And so you get these seasonal rings. And so we can count them when it's growing fast, slow, fast, slow. And we can count the years if we take a core sample. What would this look like in an area where there is no seasons? It's basically going to be uniform all the way out. Okay, so that's secondary growth. Last thing I want to finish with is the reproductive structure. We call that the flower and angiosperm. Basically, there's the male part. That right here is going to be the stamen. And then we're going to have this, the female part. And so um, the, the stamen right here is going to have on the head of it, we call this the anther, it's going to produce pollen grains. Those pollen grains are sperm essentially protected. And so those pollen grains, if they float away or are carried by a bee away, is going to be the male reproductive structure. Female structure is going to be way down here inside the ovary in this structure called the ovule. And so the egg is going to be protected right down here. And then it's surrounded by an ovary, which will eventually ripen to form fruit. But the way reproduction works in flowers is different than us. It's just not sperm meets egg. What we have is called double fertilization, which is kind of crazy, but really, really cool. So let's say that the pollen lands right here. Basically what will happen is you'll get this pollen tube that will grow all the way out, all the way down here, and it's going to grow into the ovule. Now within that pollen tube, we're going to have two sperm. And so we're going to zoom all the way down here to in the ovule. So basically the pollen tube has grown all the way down. And now we have these two sperms. So one, two sperm. Those are going to be those blue uh, haploid structures right here. We have the eggs, just like us. This is exactly the same. So we've got egg and sperm. But we also have these polar nuclei around the outside. So we have these two other nuclei. Each of those are haploid. And so basically, let's look ahead. With fertilization, one of the sperm fertilizes the egg. This is going to make the new plant or the embryo. And then we've got the other sperm fertilizing these two polar nuclei. And so this one is actually going to become triploid, and this one is going to become diploid. The diploid fertilized egg becomes the new plant. The triploid fertilized polar nuclei becomes something called the endosperm. The endosperm is triploid. Let's zoom ahead to the seed. What does that look like? Well, here's going to be that triploid endosperm. That's going to be food for the plant, and the plant is going to be the embryo right here. That's hap or excuse me, diploid. And so basically when you plant a seed, it's protected by the seed coat around the outside. This would be wheat seed. It's protected by that, but when it starts to germinate, that embryo is going to start to grow. It's going to start to become the plant, but this endosperm is going to provide the food for that growing plant as it starts to grow before it eventually starts to do photosynthesis and then the whole cycle continues again. And so what have we talked about? Structure of plants. What's going to be in the next podcast? more the physiology. How does this all work? How do we move nutrients around in a plant? But for now, I hope that's helpful.